Hi there, Eric Rhodes from Plein Air and Fine Art Connoisseur Magazines. We have been digging into the vaults and finding some of the best content. When I wanted to learn how to be a great landscape painter, I could choose from any artist in the world, and the one that I chose was Joe McGurl. I went and studied with him for a week, and my painting changed so much. Little did I know I could have just watched the video I'm going to share with you now. Here's Painting Light and Atmosphere with Joe McGurl. Hi hey guys, welcome to our plein air adventure. Plein air painting is always an adventure because you never know what's going to happen. But today we're up at Acadia National Park right above Eagle Lake in Maine. And I found a view of the lake that I think will be interesting as a subject matter. As the sun sets, we're going to get a nice reflection of the sunlight off of the water. It's always a nice challenge to try to paint something as difficult as sunlight reflecting off of water. There are also some other unique elements in the landscape that I'd like to paint today and study and learn a little bit more about how the rocks and the foliage react to the afternoon sunlight. So there's a location just to the left there that we're going to walk over and set up and start in on our painting. So I've got my spot picked out and it's got the lake coming up from the lower right hand corner of the painting, a little bit of the mountain, and I'm going to use what I call the sight size method of landscape painting. I have this frame that's the same size as my painting and I'm going to transfer everything I see in this view horizontally to my painting. This method makes it go a little bit faster because my drawing is much more accurate and I'm transferring the exact same size and shape of the objects that I see onto my panel ex at that exact same size and shape. Um, one thing I'm anticipating is that the sun's going to move over to the right a little bit and I'm going to get some nice glare in the water from the lake and it's going to be contrasted really nicely with the deep tones in the mountain. As the sun goes behind the mountain, the shadows are going to get bigger. The first thing I do is I'm going to lay in some points that indicate the different major parts of the, paint, of the scene. And so I'm going to take a point on the actual scene and make a mark on my canvas in the exact same spot. And I can adjust how much I see by moving forwards and backwards. I'm going to have I'm starting with the lake because that's kind of the major feature of the painting. Moving up to the large shapes of the mountain. Painting them at the exact, the exact same height and in the same proportions that I see them in real life on my panel. Once I have this all laid in, I may decide to make some minor adjustments here and there to improve the composition, but I don't want to change too much because I want to keep the essence and the feeling of this actual place that I am. But sometimes you can make some minor compositional changes. There's the foreground, these rocks foliage beyond the rocks. I shut one eye and squint with the other one. It's kind of a crazy way to be painting, some people would think, but that allows me to see the large shapes and not get too caught up in details.
I'm going to paint in some of the shadow shapes. They're going to be changing as the sun goes down. And I'm going to be chasing the shadows a little bit as I move along. But at a certain point, I'm going to have to commit. So I'll decide when that point is, when the shadows look really interesting. Then I can decide that, OK, this is where I'm going to keep the shadows. And I won't be adjusting them anymore after that. There's going to be a little rim light at the top of this foreground hill. A lot of this initial painting is kind of like sort of mental notes to me. Just where the big features are. I want to work fairly quickly because the light is moving and I want to be sure that I capture that glare in the water before it leaves. Once I have my major elements drawn, I don't have to be as careful about standing at the right place so I can see my painting at the same scale as the actual scene. Then I can move in closer. I'm checking to make sure that everything sort of lines up pretty closely to what I'm looking at. And it does. So now I'll go in. And the first thing I'll do is make with burnt umber, just sort of a wash, giving everything sort of a general overall tone, but preserving my lines. This is, that way I can see where I want to have my little rim light on the different planes. So I'm going to start, generally speaking, I start, start with the background and move forward and start with the big shapes and move to smaller shapes. So the first thing I want to do is get these big shapes in the background just sort of blocked in. This hillside here is in shadow. The one beyond it is going to be in shadow also. It's going to be a bit, a little bit lighter and bluer than the one in the foreground, the hill in the foreground, because of the atmospheric perspective. There's a deep dark shadow along the edge of the lake where those trees meet the lake. So I want to put that in, have that fairly dark there. Again, it's going to be much darker than the shadows of the hills in the distance. I'm going to move the lake up just a little bit. So I'll wipe off that burnt umber color that I have there so I'm not competing with it. When I start to put the, the sunlight on the water, I don't have to overcome all that paint. I'm going to wash in a general tone that's sort of the average color of the foliage that's in sunlight. And since it's October up here, there's a lot of autumn colors. So I'm going to mix up sort of a warm yellowish green, a little bit of orange in it. I'm keeping it slightly dark because when I go back into the foliage, 
I want to be able to put some highlights on the trees in the distance. So if I keep this a little bit darker than it, the general tone, I'll be able to do that. I keep redrawing and refining the drawing as I go to. Sometimes I spend a great deal of time in the preliminary drawing, but in this case I don't want to lose the sunlight, so I'm going to work kind of quickly. Now moving to the foreground foliage, and that's going to be the most intense color-wise. We have these yellowish, sort of yellow, warm yellow bushes in the foreground. And the rocks. I'm going to warm up the color on the rocks a little bit because I'm anticipating that as the sun goes down, they're going to warm up a little bit more than they are. I also want to increase the angle of these rocks a little bit. They're in real life, they're running sort of parallel to the shore of the, of the lake, and I don't want those two parallel lines, so I'm going to make the rocks in the foreground a little bit steeper. I'm going to go back in and redraw the lake a little bit, make some corrections here and there, right on the edge, bring it up. The far shore of the lake is just about horizontal. Before I put the, the sunlight on that lake, I'm going to make sure I wipe off as much pigment as I can so it's not altering the, the color that I'm putting on the lake. It's going to have to be really bright and really clean. I'm going to mix up a color for the sky. And when you look into the sun, the sky has a, more of a warm yellowy tone to it. So I'm going to mix up some cerulean blue and a little bit of cadmium or Hansa yellow. So what I'm envisioning is a big pool of light, sunlight here and it'll be balanced by the little triangle of sunlight here. I'm mixing up the color for that background hill now. Each time I mix a new color, I sort of I'll refine it and make it a little bit closer to what I'm actually seeing. The first lane was just to sort of tone the panel and also to help with my drawing. I generally go from the general to the more specific. 
So I start with big shapes and the general tone, and then I go in and start dividing up the bigger shapes and get more accurate with the color. But I still want to, compositionally, I still want to have a lot of big shapes because big shapes are strong and sh small shapes are weak. So I want to make sure that I have some really big shapes that are going to be anchoring this composition. This foreground hill is going to be much darker than the one, the hill behind it. I still haven't locked myself in totally to the shape of these shadows that are being cast by this foreground hill, but I'm getting closer. At a certain point, I'm going to have to commit. The interesting thing about plein air painting is you're kind of painting the average of all these different phenomena that happen while you're out in the field because the light's continually changing and the weather's changing and if you're painting the ocean, the tide's coming in or going out. So you're out, you don't really have an instantaneous view. It's sort of the different snippets of time. I'm not exactly sure where that shadow will end up, but I'm getting closer to where I think it's going to be when I decide to commit. I want to go back into the foreground and strike a couple of really dark notes so I know where my value range is going to be. So I'm going to mix up some ultramarine blue and a little bit of black. And there's a bush right here. It's quite dark. I'm going to move this rock down a little bit. I don't want that much of the rock showing. There's a bush right here that has some really dark shadows underneath it. So that's going to be just about the darkest element in my painting. And there's a bush here that's got a dark shadow underneath it. So now I have to move this foliage down a little bit. redraw that edge of the lake there a little bit. So the wind has picked up and it's gotten a little colder so I'm getting a little bit warm. I'm putting on another couple layers. When you're painting outside, you're standing still for a long time and the cold starts to permeate and you get uh, really chilly. So I always bring a couple layers of clothing. You can see just a little bit of the trees along the shoreline of the lake on the close side of the lake. So I'm going to indicate them. And in a couple of minutes when the sun moves over further, they're going to be silhouetted against that lake. So they're going to be fairly dark.
Now I have a lot of angles going this way, which sort of starting at the right and slanting down. I mean, starting at the left and slanting down to the right, which I don't really like. So I'm going to have to figure out a way to change some of those angles. And as the shadows move down this mountain, that may do it for me. So I may not have to worry about it too much. I'm not sure yet. So I'll let that sit for a little while. And then I'm going to go back into this background mountain and work on that a little bit. Actually, before I do that, I just want to get these bushes in the foreground a little bit more defined and also get the color a little bit more to what I think it's going to be in about 20 minutes or a half hour when I start to commit. So I've changed the slope of this rock, which means I'm not going to see as many bushes on this side of this bush here. And that's good because in real life, these bushes are forming sort of a barrier. There's a horizontal or a diagonal barrier going across the painting. If I break it here, it allow you to go over this rock into the painting and then up to the lake and to the background. If, if I had the bushes as they are in actuality, extending from here to here, it's a barrier that you have to sort of leap over visually and it prevents you from entering the painting. So I try not to have a band that goes all the way across the painting in the foreground. I'm going to cool down those rocks a little bit. I have them a little bit too warm in the foreground. So the white I use is called underpainting white. It's made by Windsor and Newton. And I really like it because it sets up really fast. And it allows me to keep working without the painting getting too soupy and too wet to really keep working on. With the underpainting white, I can work for a really long time before I have a problem of the, there just being too much paint on the surface. I want to get rid of this white line at the top of that mountain because it's hard to see how my values are looking because I have this white edge that's interfering with what I'm looking at. So if I can get rid of that, I'll have a better idea whether this is too dark or too light. I walk back every couple of minutes also to see how the composition's looking. Sometimes if your nose is right in the painting for too long a period of time, you don't realize that you're making a shape that isn't working very well. And when you stand back, you can see the shapes better. There's some ridges in the back background mountain that are picking up some light. And I'm going to accentuate them a little bit because they're, they're at the opposite angle of all these other angles. So I want to get some angles going from the upper right to the lower left, where I have so many going from the upper left to the, to the lower right. Uh, 
the, but it's not following the contour of the of the land so I'm gonna have to figure out what I want to do about that if I change it too much it doesn't follow the geometry of the mountain in the background and it starts to look not very accurate so sometimes I sort of feel my way along and see what I can do to make it follow the geometry of the mountain but also work compositionally I'm still not exactly sure what's going to happen with this background mountain when the sun goes down a little bit more. So I think I'm going to wipe off a lot of that paint that I put on there so I don't have to fight it if I decide to change the color as I move along through the painting. This is a beat up fan brush that I often use to indicate foliage and some of the the forms of nature are really organic and sort of uh, chaotic. And so by using a brush that's a little bit beat up on the edge and gives a much more random and natural looking brush mark than a square or a filbert or a flatwood, um, I can get replicate the look of nature a little bit quicker. Because we're, you're in the field, you've got to really save time. And so I don't want to spend time trying to make foliage look like foliage with a square brush. I'd rather start with an organic sort of ratty looking brush that replicates the shape of leaves and trees and such all by itself without me having to worry about trying to render them with a, a square brush. So I'm going to indicate some of the foliage on this far shore because I want to keep that illuminated a little bit. I'm sort of following the contour of the land with my with my brush marks. It's almost like I'm printing with this. I'm gonna, I'm going to be modifying the marks I like I make a little bit more as I go along, but this gives me sort of a base that I can work off of. For the trees and the, the distant mountain, I'm going to lighten the color a little bit and warm it up a little bit, get rid of some of the yellow. Yellow is the color that disappears first when you move off into the distance. So if you want to give the effect of atmosphere, tone down your yellows first.
Okay, I can see that I want to make the shadow part of the distant mountain deeper. So I'm going to mix up a little bit of cerulean blue, a little bit of burnt umber, some white. Mix in some of this is oleopasto. Or no, I'm sorry, it's liquid impasto. It's uh, made by Winsor & Newton. And I like it as a, a medium to use with my paint. It makes it a little bit translucent. It makes it nice and thick. And it, there again, this also sets up and, and dries fairly quickly in the field, particularly in the summer. It's kind of cold out today, so it's not gonna really dry very much. But on a nice summer day, that dries really nicely. I'm going to use brush marks that follow the contour of the land and that will help to describe the form. One of the things about painting landscapes is you have two competing elements. You have texture and you have form and sometimes you get too carried away with describing the texture but you lose the form. So whenever you're creating texture, you also want to think about maintaining the form and have the texture reinforce the form of the object that you're painting. I'm going to go back in and restate this form in this background hill. You can see how this brush gives a little bit of an indication of the foliage on that mountain in the background. Got a little bit of variety in the background colors. There's some of the pine trees that are illuminated, illuminated also. So I'm gonna put some green tones in there.
there's a little bit of sunlight on some of the rocks on the top of that mountain. So I'm going to mix up a, a warm, very warm light, sort of a grayish, but with a lot of warmth in it just to indicate some of the sunlight on the rocks. Now that background hill is pretty good for now. I think I'm going to leave it and move to the foreground hill. The foreground hill is going to have more vibrant colors. And once again, I want to maintain the form. There's a beautifully illuminated line of pine trees on the top of this ridge. You can see how much by using this sort of scruffy brush, you can see how much it's the work it's doing for me in describing these pine trees. It's actually getting a little warmer, I think. So now I'm going to mix up kind of a neutral, cool, neutral color for the shadow area of those pine trees. So I'm mixing some ultramarine blue, burnt umber, I want to make sure I don't get it too dark because I have to reserve some dark, really dark tones for this foreground area here. Now the sun is just about directly overhead from my subject, but it's moving to the right. So I'm anticipating that in a little while the shadows are going to be coming from the right going to the left. So I'm anticipating that a little bit and making my shadows do that a little bit now. Sometimes when you're playing or paint, you've got to, kind of, you've got to anticipate what the sun is going to be doing. Because if you paint in the moment the whole time, your light is going to be different throughout the painting. So it's, I paint a little bit what I think is going to happen. Then there's a period of time where the light is right and I paint what is happening. And then as the light continues to move, I paint what I remember happened. So you're kind of painting in the future, the present, and the past. This guy knows how to teach. Joe McGurl is phenomenal. He will transform you as a landscape painter.
nine plus hours of video in training from Joe on painting light and atmosphere. You're gonna love it and you can find it at lilyartvideo.com. Now let's get to an interview. Well, we're here today with Joe McGurl, and we want to find out what makes Joe tick. So what is it? What's the answer to that great question? Um, I guess it's passion for what I do. Um, I've, since I was a child, I knew I wanted to be an artist. My father was an artist, so I grew up with that in the sort of in my blood, I guess. And um, you know, when I was a kid, I was always drawing and really got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And as I got older, I realized that this is something I wanted to pursue. I went to art college, and it was in the 70s when there wasn't a lot of focus on representational painting. And so there was this small group of sort of, I guess you would call them rebels, who were doing representational painting, <coughs> as opposed to the majority of our classmates who were doing abstract and conceptual type of artwork. Uh, once I got through college, I um, pursued a couple other things for a short period of time, but came back to art and to painting particularly because um, it was the one thing that really gave me a real sense of fulfillment and it was challenging. I wasn't able to paint what I wanted to paint the way I wanted to paint it. So there's always something to strive for, always trying to get better. And I uh, eventually hooked up with Robert Cormier, who was a, um, a teacher and an artist at the Guild of Boston Artists in Boston. And he was trained in the 19th century French Academy methods of drawing and painting. Who did he study with? He studied with R. H. Ives Gamel, who was a student of Paxton, and he studied with Jerome, Jerome. And, and such. So there was this wonderful chain of knowledge that was handed down through the generations. And I studied with him, and it was a real turning point because he taught me the sight size method of drawing and also just this philosophy that it's really important to be careful and exact and accurate in your drawing. And then you can expand from there, but you have to at some stage be able to reproduce things with a great deal of fidelity to the actual thing that you're painting or drawing. And that taught me to really slow down and be really careful and observant about um, my artwork. You're meticulous when you paint. Um, when you see my paintings finished, they're meticulous, but in the process, they're actually pretty sloppy. And there are several layers and several different um, techniques that I use, but I guess I'm, in, I'm meticulous in how I want them to end up in the, in the end. But I do a lot of manipulating with the paint surface. I'll scratch it and sand it, um, carve into it, put on really thick impasto paint and glaze it and such. So there's a lot of processes and manipulating of the paint that goes on. And that helps me to um, reproduce the effects found in nature in paint. And one of my goals is to try to capture the reality that we experience in real life in paint on a painted surface. It's really quite an abstract concept because you have reality that we experience in three dimensions, or actually many dimensions we know now, and time, and it's a full of uh, this frenzy of activity on a subatomic level, and um, we have all our senses activated. And then we're trying to boil that down into one sense, just your sense of vision. And even at that, you're shutting one eye because you're seeing it flat. And so you're trying to take this multi-dimensional experience and convert it into a one-dimensional visual experience, which is really quite an abstract process. And that's one of the things that intrigues me um, now these days is uh, creating that one-dimensional representation of a multi-dimensional process. And I think that even when I was a kid, that was still the thing that fascinated me with art, was that I could portray these things that either happened to me or that I imagined or I saw on a piece of paper. And that transference, it's really an abstract, very abstract concept. And that's the thing that made it, it like magic. You know, people always talk about the magic of art. And for me, transferring this multi-dimensional surface into one dimension is the real magic. So the, <clears throat> but a lot of people will misread what you've said and say, well, you're painting a photograph. But you're not. I mean, your, your paintings don't look photographic, yet they look, they, they don't look photorealistic, yet they look alive and real. So what's the difference? Uh, well, the big difference is that I don't use photographs at all. I, I never use them. 
Um, and that's what you said is actually what I'm trying for, is to make them look real, not photographic. There's this whole, you know, a lot of times people say, oh my God, it looks just like a photo. <laughs> and they mean it as a compliment and that's all fine. But my goal, you know, photography mimics painting. Actually, when they invented photography, it was great because it looks like a painting, but it's, you know, a different process. But my purpose, my goal is to try to make my paintings look real and express the reality that we experience as human beings. There's, with reality, I consider myself a realist as well as a contemporary luminist. But the realist part, I'm trying to portray reality as we experience it. There's an ultimate reality throughout the universe that we can't experience because our senses are limited. For instance, a bat experiences reality in a much different way than we do. And a camera, there again, experiences experiences reality in a way different than we do. So I don't want those interferences coming into my artwork. So well, I and, and photographs lie. Photographs deepen the shadows. Mm -hmm. They slightly skew the perspective. There's a lot of things in photographs that aren't what you see. Right, exactly. And they can't experience things the way a human being can experience, just like a bat can't experience things the way a human being can't experience them. So I'm trying to portray the reality, it's a humanistic reality, the way we as humans respond to nature and the way we can sort of try to understand it. And ultimately, it sort of leads to the big question, you know, what is, what's life? What's the meaning of life? What is it all about? And when I'm well, in the It's field, funny you should mention that because that was going to be my next question. <laughs> <laughs> what the meaning of life is. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, when I'm in the field painting landscapes, I really feel close to that question. I obviously don't feel close to the answer, but I feel like this is where the answer would be found. Somewhere contemplating nature and trying to be sort of one with nature and where the, almost the line between myself and the landscape that I'm painting disappears. But the painting is kind of a conduit between that line. It goes from ultimate reality to the reality that I can experience to the painting and then to me, or actually maybe to me and then the painting, but there's the three of us. There's reality, there's me as a human, my humanistic interpretation of reality, and the painting that sort of results from that. And for you, what is that experience? Obviously, we have this demonstration of, of you going through the process, but when you're out on your own and you don't have a camera, following you around and the discomfort of all the lights and all the other things that go with it. What, what is your typical experience when you go out? Um, is, is it different than other painters? Do you approach it differently? Yeah, I think it's different. I think every artist has their own little way that they approach things and they're all right and they're all wrong. I mean, for, for myself, my way is fairly unique because my philosophy is, is unique to, to me. So these other artists who I greatly admire, but you know, some of them use photos, some of them are really strong colorists and such, and they're doing something different than me. So they're right pursuing that for them to reach their goals. But for my goals, I have something a little bit unique to me. And to, usually when I'm going out uh, plein air painting, I'm looking for something interesting. It could be a light effect, it could be something geological or meteorological, just something that fascinates me and I'll make a painting or a sketch of that because I'm trying to understand it, what's happening, how are the different elements reacting and interacting and, and such. And I'm not so much concerned about making a painting. There are a lot of plein air artists who will go out and their goal is to make a painting, a finished work of art. My goal is to go out and understand nature on a much deeper level. And by not using a photograph, it forces me to concentrate really, really deeply at what I'm looking at and try to understand it and decipher it because when I leave the field I don't have anything to refer to other than what I painted during that session. So a lot of times I'll just keep digging in and trying to f get everything, all the information I can out of that site. Then I'll take the plein air painting back to the studio and I may, may never turn it into a finished painting but it's allowed me to understand na this little aspect of nature a little bit more deeply. And after doing this for 30 years, I've got this storehouse of knowledge of the different forms of nature, how they interact and how they work, so I can make things up. It gives me a lot of opportunity to be much more creative and imaginative because I don't have to worry about, oh, how do I make this look right and fit in the landscape? 
So I can invent these completely imaginary landscapes, but they have enough truth to them that they're believable. Um, right now, most of my paintings are imaginary. Probably 80% are completely made up from my imagination with no sketch to go on. It's sort of this accumulation of knowledge that I've sort of accumulated and sort of apply to the painting that I'm looking at. So can you impart some of that knowledge on us? Uh, you've got a lot of painters who are watching this who are trying to figure out their, <clears throat> their direction, their ride, their, the, you know, the, the goal should not be for them to mimic you, should be to find their own voice, but mm -hmm. there's a starting point. They, want to, they respect you, they want to learn what you know. What is it that perhaps you might approach a little differently in some of the knowledge that you've, you, you're willing to share that might help some of these painters go on their path in the proper way? Right. Um, I, well, the first thing is just spending a lot of time in the landscape. Um, and staying with one theme, I think, helps a little bit. For instance, when I find something that's interesting, if I find a location that really intrigues me, I'll go back to that again and again and do maybe a dozen paintings of that one spot, some drawings or whatever. But at the end of this session, I understand what I'm looking at so much more deeply than if I was going around and sort of painting these snapshots of a quick little a painting here, another painting over there. So by this sort of intense focus, it allows me to concentrate really very deeply on sort of one aspect. And then when I think I've explored that enough, I'll move on to something else or something else will catch my attention and intrigue me. A lot of times when I go on a painting trip, for instance, I'll spend the first few days sort of moseying around looking for different things. And eventually something will speak to me and it just has this really strong presence. And I'll spend the rest of the time analyzing that. Um, a few years ago, I went to Italy and I found this stone structure and I painted it from all different sides and different times of the day. And it was just a wonderful experience and it allowed me to really delve into that much, much more deeply. Mm -hmm. On sort of a practical level, um, I consider myself a contemporary luminist also, as I said, uh, mentioned previously, and that means that light is really important to me. So I'm always thinking about what the light is doing. And when you look at a landscape, you want to determine whether the objects in the landscape are in the light or in the shade. And it's sort of like never the two shall meet. So um, a lot of beginner painters in particular, they sort of have this fuzzy area in the middle where the light's on one part of the object and then it turns into this sort of no man's land and then it's in the shade. But if you look at nature, that half light is very tiny. It's a very thin sliver. So generally speaking, you want to look at things and say, is this in the light or is this in the shade? And I'm always thinking of that, no matter what I'm painting, in the back of my mind is always, what is the light doing? And, the and, light and that half light is, a, is typically, if I understand it right, more, typically more chroma, more, is there a particular trick to that? They used to call it, I think in the Boston school, they called it the bed bug line. You're right, exactly. Um, I, I think it depends on the object and the, the quality of light and such, whether it's more chrome or more value, but it is a transition. And one of the things I learned in the Boston School from uh, the figure in cast drawing is that transition is very sharp. It's much sharper than most people make it. A lot of people, if you paint a ball, for instance, a lot of people make the transition from light to shade much too subtle and much too soft. But if you actually look at that ball, it's almost a very hard line with just the edge of that bed bug line um, shade uh, in half light and softened. So I think um, being aware that objects are either in the light or in the shade helps a lot. And also it helps to think of the form also because the light is describing the form. Without the light, you have no form. For instance, even on a cloudy day, suddenly the form begins to dissolve. So if you're painting on a sunny day, the light is going to help enhance the sense of form. And there again, we're painting a flat object and we're trying to convince the viewer that it's in three dimensions. So by increasing that sense of light and paying real close attention to the sunny part and the shady part and a little bit of a half light part, we create a greater sense of form which creates a greater sense of depth in the painting. So that's the other thing I'm always thinking about when I'm painting something is the form. For instance, a cloud, a rock, and a tree all have a similar form. They're sort of these maybe oblong objects with a top and front and sides and a bottom and a back. The only difference between them are the details and the, um, the actual sort of surface of them. But generally speaking, they have the same overall form. So you always want to remember that there's a, a form to everything and that helps give you that three-dimensional quality that we're looking for. 
So everybody has to go through a learning process. Everybody has to go through a lot of bad paintings and a lot of bad drawings, and, and <clears throat> there are no shortcuts. Right. <laughs> but if there were any, what would they be? Oh my gosh. Well, I guess the, I think the first thing that people struggle with is just trying to make things look real. And you're right, there are no shortcuts. Um, the Planner Painters of America group that I'm in, with, we, um, we talk about admitting new members and all the members seem older and we don't have any young members. And it's because it takes a long time to be able to do this at a high level. Every now and then you'll have an aberration like Sajin, who seemed like by the time he was 15 could paint amazingly. But generally speaking, it just takes a lot of hours and a lot of time put in the field to be able to paint. And I wish there were a shortcut because I would, I would still like to use it. <laughs> I think the first thing you struggle with though is just trying to make things look real. But you're not really a professional until you've reached that level where you can make things look real and now you have something to say. And art is communication and it's communicating an idea. So there has to be some type of an idea behind your art to sort of give it a purpose and give it a meaning. Otherwise, it's just sort of a beautiful rendering. You know, everything looks very, um, everything is very aesthetically pleasing and it's a beautiful painting, but it doesn't say anything. Yeah. And it's not about something. And it's, it would be like a poem that has beautiful rhythm and such, but at the end you say, well, what was the poet trying to convey? What right. idea? Right. So. Um, that's the next step that you take after you can render things. And it took me years and years before I really knew what I was, what I was saying. And it's funny because it's something that was in, within me all the time. And eventually I just, it sort of bubbled up and I realized this is what my art is about. Well, I, I studied photographer, photography with a, a very well-known photographer and I went to a, my first workshop and we were focusing on very basic technique and but and I said but I want to go out and photograph trees and rocks and whatever and he says no 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 the creative comes after you learn the technique he said you want to get to the technique to the point where you can do it in your sleep where it's second nature because once it's second nature then whatever it is flowing inside of you that you want to speak out about the scene is what will come out, but you can't do it until you at least get the technical part out. Is that, would you say that's accurate? Absolutely. When I was in college, one of the things they used to say, this was in the 70s, remember, is that, well, this technique's going to stifle your creativity. Right. And actually, the opposite is true, because my big problem when I was younger was that I didn't have the technique to express what I wanted to express. If you have the technique, then nothing stops you from expressing your ideas. So you want to get your technique down first so you can paint anything and you're not struggling with rendering things. And then you can express your creativity. Um, a lot of times it seems like artists put the horse before the cart and the cart before the horse. Same thing. <laughs> and, <laughs> and they're, you know, they're trying to be expressive, but they're just not, they don't have the technical chops to do it. So you, and there again, it just requires putting in the hours and the time. And, it takes a long time. So how, how do you feel about this um, plein air movement? There's thousands of artists now that are painting outdoors, so that's changed a lot since you started, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of shows, and dare I say there's a lot of uncooked work out there that's getting into the market. Do you have any feeling about any of that? Um. Well, I think the, it's great that we have this big, vibrant, vigorous movement. When I was first out of plein air painting, they didn't have all these pochade boxes and French easels and such. I had a, the only thing I could find was this big wooden suitcase that weighed about 40 pounds and took five, 10 minutes to set up. Uh, but because the demand is so great, now there are you know, dozens and dozens of manufacturers of pochade boxes and plein air painting supplies and all t types of events that people can get organized with. Sometimes there may be a, an issue with there just being so much that the quality goes down because there are only so many good painters and there's only so many good paintings when the more venues you have, the more work they have to accept to fill the venue and such. So I guess it's like, you know, it's like everything. It's a little bit of a compromise and, you know, maybe the quality's not quite as good as it could be. But it's great to have this vigorous movement that's, you know, Right now, representational painting, plein air painting is one of the biggest movements in the country. Unfortunately, the art establishment 
seems to be totally dismissive of it, which is kind of strange, but um, I guess that's the world we live in as representational painters. Well, I'd like to go there for a second. Uh, you, you showed me something when we were together in Maine. A bunch of us all gathered upstairs in this one room at this house, and you gave a little PowerPoint presentation, mm -hmm. some thoughts on what was happening in the in the art world and yeah. how that was all somewhat manipulated. Are you willing to talk about that? Uh, sure, yeah, a little bit. Uh, we don't have enough time for me to go into the whole thing because <laughs> no. I could go on, but... Uh, yeah, I guess one of the frustrations is the, the amount of money that's in the, the um, contemporary um, establishment art world is just, it's overriding the quality and it seems like money is the un, sort of the, the big influence in pushing that movement forward. And a lot of times you'll see shows at museums and it's sort of the same artists and it's the same work that's being promoted and it's all backed by a lot of investment in the part of the museum and investors and such. And I think that there's so much money that it makes what we do really irrelevant because you have a piece of artwork that was exhibited in a museum and it, you know, things similar to that had sold for $20, $50 million. And we come in with our paintings that are you know, $50,000, $60,000. And how can there be any parity between the two? So then you say, well, obviously this is a much better artwork because it's you know, $50 million worth and this is only a $50,000 painting. So that has virtually you know, no relative value. So it's hard to fight that juggernaut of money that's infiltrated the contemporary art world. And the museums are spending a lot of money that, on artwork that's been manipulated in the, um, in the auctions and buying and selling and such. So I think it's frustrating as representational painters to try to fight that and f somehow find a way to make our art somewhat legitimate in light of the money that these, um, the contemporary outward is that world that they're sort of delving into which is well what, so why does it matter influenced. why does it matter if we fight it because <clears throat> with uh, obviously there's nothing wrong with money and making money as a painter and it'd be great to be able to get 50 million or 20 million for a painting but with that may come some compromises that seem to be occurring in the other side of the art world a mm -hmm. lot of compromises that seem to be being made. Right. Um, and I would think someone like yourself wouldn't be willing to make those compromises over money alone. No, and I don't think we want to get 50 or 60 million dollars and have our paintings be manipulated by investors and auction houses and such. But I guess what I would like to see is at least some acknowledgement that this huge movement is going on. Right now it's the most vigorous art movement in the country and it's completely ignored by the art establishment. And one of the reasons is because the money that the art establishment is entangled with is such a, a big nut for us to crack that we just can't make any headway into that, into that whole world. Um, and art shouldn't, you know, it isn't about money for most of the artists that I know. It's about, you know, doing something that they love. Obviously we need money to survive, so we have to sell our paintings and such. And I don't have a complaint with even the money that the abstract painters are making at all, that's fine. It's just that it's this roadblock that we're up against. Right. And we can't get into that club without, you know, with the, the disparity between the money that we, the, the perceived value, I should say, between our paintings and their artwork. Yeah, there's a sense of this can't be good and that can't be good. It's, this can be good, this can be expensive, but that can't. It's so it's not really inclusionary, which is kind of the opposite of what everybody preaches in that world, but uh, it's okay to be exclusionary of something that they want to diss, which mm -hmm. is basically something that, you know, if you can tell what it is, it's not acceptable in their world. It right. Seems. Um, it's where, where the Impressionists were in the 1860s, where, you know, in, in those days, the establishment wasn't accepting their artwork. And basically the, the gallery auction houses and the galleries, the auction houses and the sal uh, museums are the salon of the 20th and 21st century. And we just can't get through the door just in the same way that the Impressionists couldn't get into the salon. 
in the 1860s. Mm -hmm. um, we're the revolutionaries now. That's right. Um, and you know, this is the type of art that people respond to. And museums are supposed to reflect the society. One of their aspects, one of their functions, is to reflect the society that um, yeah, at a certain period of time. And if you, in a couple of hundred years, if you look at what the museums are collecting, you would say, well, there was no representational painting going on in America at all because they don't have any of it. So in a way, it's doing a disservice to future generations because they will assume that all of the American art appreciating public were they were buying Jeff Koons sculptures and um, Damien Hirst and such. Sharks. When it's, there's a very small segment of extremely wealthy investors who were buying those. But the public at large and the art lovers at large were not buying them. They're buying them, putting them in storage, waiting a few years, bringing them out of storage, and hopefully selling them for more money. Absolutely. Most of that, a good part of that work ends up in storage till it comes out again after it's appreciated enough. Yeah. Anything else that you would like to share with the people on this DVD that you, you think might be helpful for them to know or understand? Um, I think that you have to have that passion that I spoke about, or spoke about earlier in order to really blossom and to move forward in, in the art world. You can, if you want to be a hobbyist and you dabble with it and such, that's great. And there's, you know, there's room for that too. But if you have that passion, it's sort of something that comes out of you and you find that you have to do it all the time. And I basically, I paint all the time. I, probably put in about 100 hours a week hmm. at the easel. And it's because I love it. It's the thing that I love to do. And if, um, if there's any way I can get more painting time in, I, <laughs> I always try to find that extra few hours or extra few minutes. Having a studio in the house is great, too, because I'm at home with the family, too. But um, I think it's following your passion, putting in the hours in the field. Um, making intelligent decisions and thinking about what you're painting and why you're painting it. There's sort of three different elements to my art. There's the empirical, the rational, and the humanistic. And the empirical is the stuff that I see when I'm out painting a landscape. Um, I'm observing things and I'm recording them. Then the rational is something I do back in the studio where I reinvent paintings, but it's all sort of because of the knowledge I've gained. I can say, well, if this rock is going to be in this position, there's going to be another rock here, and there's going to be a beach section here and a tree up there. So I can, rash I can think logically how the progression from shoreline to upland would go in a landscape. Mm -hmm. So I'm making that up, but I'm making it up based on the empirical observations I had in the field. And then the final element is the humanistic aspect. It's what I bring to it, which the thing that makes the paintings unique to me. You know, there's a lot of flaws in my art and there's a lot of strengths and, and such, but it's all part of me. And back to the camera thing, I would rather have my flaws, but also it be going through my filter rather than have this photographically accurate depiction of what I'm doing. So the, the more direct connection I can have to the subject, I think the more of, of myself is, is put into the painting where if I had a photograph, it would be going through the filter of the photograph and then th back to me. So um, I, th I think that, yeah, that's probably maybe my last thought. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for doing this today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure talking to you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed Painting, Light, and Atmosphere with Joe McGurl. He's really a brilliant guy. You can learn more about it at lilyartvideo.com. I'm Eric Rhodes.